So I was originally, I'm going to um, show that I have no uh, conflicts of interest and nothing to disclose. But what I will disclose is that I was initially asked to specifically speak on anticoagulation in the thrombocytopenic patient. And my response was, I do this every day. I'm the medical director of two anticoagulation management services, one at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I'm a benign hematologist who does anticoagulation. However, there aren't a lot of data. And so I said, I will talk about experience, but there may not be a lot of data to back it up. I've pulled together what data there are, and we'll review that um, this morning. I'm going to first touch on anticoagulation and thrombocytopenia in the cancer patient, and then review what we do in patients with ITP who develop DVTs. And I also have a case-based um, format. So for case one, we have, a, and these are um, actual cases that I've encountered, we have a 58-year-old man with IgG kappa myeloma who was treated for six years. He is diagnosed with a symptomatic segmental PE on day 15 after auto stem cell transplant as an outpatient. He has bilateral lower, his bilateral lower extremity ultrasounds are negative for DVT. He has mild to moderate right-sided chest pain, dyspnea with exertion, his heart rate is 102, his blood pressure is 132 over 78, his room air O2 saturation is 91%. Both renal and hepatic function are normal, and his platelet count is 11,000. You decide to treat with the following, A, thrombolysis with TPA, B, IVC filter, C, dabigatran 110 milligrams BID, platelet transfusion and low molecular weight heparin, or E, no anticoagulation, the risks are too high. And this is a question I get asked quite frequently. So what do we need to do when we're assessing this patient? We basically need to look at the risks of anticoagulation versus the risks of not treating a pulmonary embolus. So when we look at mortality of untreated pulmonary emboli, we have extremely dated studies from the past that suggest in the non-cancer po patient population, there's a 25 to 30 percent mortality um, going back, say, 30 years or so um, out of emergency room-driven studies. More recent data from emergency rooms um, suggests that for patients in whom a diagnosis of PE is missed, there's roughly a 5 percent mortality. Now, we know that acute VTE, the risks for propagation um, and development of other DVTs are highest in the first four to 12 weeks after diagnosis. Cancer patients in particular um, have a higher all-cause mortality at six months if they are not treated for incidental PEs. And this was a data that was pre uh, presented at ASH this past December. Um, from uh, the Netherlands studies show that patients who did not get treated for incidental PEs had 47% mortality at six months compared to 30% for those patients who were treated for incidental PE. The Reedy Registry study from Spain demonstrated that patients with cancer who had a PE or and had DVT who were treated, even though treated, had a 2.6% mortality within three months of, of first being treated. Again, mortality related to VTE with a fatal PE. So the stakes are high if we don't treat pulmonary emboli and VTE in the cancer patient. It's the second leading cause of death, um, second to the primary malignancy. So now we need to look at bleeding risks. What are the bleeding risks? Approximately 7% of cancer patients will bleed um, while on anticoagulation with a normal platelet count. Fatal bleeding, again, in the Spanish registry study was demonstrated to be uh, 1% within three months of starting anticoagulation. This patient, however, has no other known bleeding risks. And most importantly, in this patient, the duration of thrombocytopenia um, is expected to be limited. He's in the setting of recovery from auto uh, stem cell transplant. We expect him to um, engraft uh, his platelets um, soon. So what are the data for anticoagulating patients uh, with cancer and thrombocytopenia? There are two studies that are frequently cited. Uh, the first uh, was published in Leukemia and Lymphoma in 2004. And this was a case series or case report of 10 patients who had chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia. They were treated with varying doses of low molecular weight heparin, 
either for VTE prophylaxis for central access catheter, sorry for all the abbreviations, um, or they were actually treated for acute VTE. The doses were decreased during platelet nadirs from chemotherapy, and the doses were all over the map for these 10 patients. They report no major bleeding and no fatal bleeding. The second study was more robust and published by Montreal in the journal Thrombosis Hemostasis also in the same year. And he took uh, 203 patients with metastatic cancer who were treated with a fixed dose of daltaparin at 10,000, initially 200 units per kilo for the first month and then dropped to 10,000 a day. When patients had platelet nadirs um, from chemotherapy, the dose of daltaparin was decreased um, as listed on the slide. If the platelet count was less than 50,000, the dose was decreased uh, to 5,000 uh, units per day. And if the platelet count was even less than 10,000, patients received 2,500 units of daltaparin. They um, found that uh, six fatal bleeds, 5.4% major bleeds overall, and two fatal recurrent VTE um, in, uh, roughly 8.9% of the patients had recurrent VTE of some type. Numerically slightly um, different. Let's see if I can find the pointer here. Numerically somewhat different, but statistically not that different. So bleeding and clotting risks are really um, um, uh, both high in these patients, but we tend to anticoagulate because of the risk of, of fatal uh, death from PE. So those are the, the papers that are cited when we talk about anticoagulation in the thrombocytopenic cancer patient. What we do have are consensus statements and consensus guidelines from a variety of uh, oncology societies and the ACCP or um, uh, cardiac uh, chest guidelines. So ASCO in 2013 um, stated that an absolute contraindication for anticoagulation is a patient with persistent severe thrombocytopenia um, as, with a platelet count of less than 20,000. A relative contraindication to anticoagulation is persistent thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of less than 50,000. And most practitioners use a platelet cutoff of 50,000, but we have found that we can really go carry full intensity anticoagulation below 50,000. The NCCN um, in their updated guidelines in 2014 lists no absolute contraindications to anticoagulation, but use a cutoff of a platelet count of 50,000 as a relative contraindication to giving anticoagulation. The ISTH, or International Society of Thrombosis Hemostasis, um, suggests transfusing with platelets if the platelet count is less than 50,000 to maintain a platelet count of 50,000 and use anticoagulation uh, during that time. And a relative contraindication to giving any dose of anticoagulation is a platelet count of less than 25,000. And I will review the ISTH guidelines um, in the next slide. And the AT9 or ACCP uh, chest guidelines, with which I think we are all familiar, make recommendations for treatment of acute clot without regard for bleeding risk. So they, they touch on bleeding risk for prolonged duration of anticoagulation, but they advise on full intensity and, and do not really comment on, on bleeding risk um, with initiation of anticoagulation. This is a very busy slide with the big arrows pointing at the, at the highlights. So this is the scientific subcommittee of ISTH, their guidelines in detail for patients with cancer-associated thrombosis, that's what CAT stands for, and platelet counts um, and acute versus chronic clot. So a patient with an acute cancer-associated thrombocyte, um, acute cancer-associated thrombosis um, and thrombocytopenia with a platelet count less than 50,000, they recommend full therapeutic doses of anticoagulation with platelet transfusion to maintain a platelet count of greater than 50,000. If platelet transfusion is not possible or is contraindicated, ISTH suggests insertion of a retrievable filter. In our practice, we almost never do this. 
In this particular patient, he has no lower extremity DVT. Um, we find that we can use judiciously anticoagulation in patients with variable platelet counts. And I'm, I'll show you on the next slide, we'll walk through exactly how we adjust uh, anticoagulation in these patients. But we really try to avoid any intervention, any instrumentation, and certainly IVC filter placement in these patients. For subacute or chronic ca um, cancer-associated uh, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia less than 50,000, we suggest reducing the dose of low molecular weight heparin to 50% of the therapeutic dose or use a prophylactic dose in patients with a platelet count of 25 to 50,000. In our practice, we've adapted this, this scheme for patients with acute uh, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. So we have a patient who comes in with um, such as this patient and we can't maintain a platelet count um, that's high enough or for whatever reasons it's not practical to transfuse the patient with platelets, we will often use half dose of anticoagulation for a platelet count less than 30,000, less than 25,000 with careful monitoring in patients who have no large major bleeding risks. They have not had recent major GI bleed, GU bleed. They don't have um, acute uh, CNS metastases that have not been treated. And ISTH suggests discontinuing anticoagulation in patients with a platelet count of less than 25,000. Again, our case patient here has a platelet count of 11,000. So this, this represents those um, uh, dictates in a um, flow diagram. Again, we have a patient with cancer and a low platelet count, thrombocytopenia. They have an acute VTE event. If the platelet count is greater than 50,000, there's no concern, there's no anxiety, there's not much thought given. We give weight-based full-dose low molecular weight heparin. I tend to use anoxaparin in people whose platelet counts are hovering around 50,000 simply because it has the shortest half-life. Fondaparinux or Rixtra has a half-life of 20 hours, uh, so if they do start to bleed, you need to wait longer for it to wear off. If the patient has a platelet count of less than 50,000, then there are two strategies. We can transfuse to maintain a platelet count greater than 50,000 and give weight-based full-dose low molecular weight heparin. If we are unable to maintain a platelet count of greater than 50,000 and the platelet count is 20 to 50,000, we give half-dose low molecular weight heparin. And if the platelet count is less than 20,000, um, we hold anticoagulation. And sometimes we'll actually take these patients in with platelet counts less than 20,000 and judiciously give them half doses and really observe um, to see um, how they're doing. And again, we need to weigh the severity of the thrombotic event. So if it's somebody who's had a pulmonary embolus, that's very different in terms of how we feel about anticoagulating than if it's somebody who's had a calf vein DVT. So in this case, you decide to treat with, and the answer is D. And notice that I did not specify the dose of low molecular weight heparin. So again, um, cancer patients with a platelet count of uh, 11,000 and cancer patients in our institution almost never get thrombolysis, particularly if they either have large tumor mass, even with normal platelet counts. Our interventional cardiologists are very wary of tumor-associated bleeding. An IVC filter is not indicated in this patient uh, because he has no lower extremity DVT to embolize. Um, and uh, the effectiveness of filters in this um, setting have not been demonstrated. Dibigatran 110 milligrams BID is actually not even available in the United States, but we would not use one of these oral anticoagulants in this patient. Um, and again, we, shy, we try to anticoagulate every patient that we can. So moving on, this patient requires platelet transfusion roughly Monday, Wednesday, Friday as an outpatient for 10 days with his platelet count slowly uh, climbing on its own. He is engrafting. At four weeks post day zero, his platelet count is now 46,000. A repeat PECT scan reveals no evidence of pulmonary embolus. What are the next steps in his management? So he is an outpatient. This was a provoked event uh, during admission for uh, autologous stem cell transplant. We would normally um, uh, state that he should get three months of anticoagulation. Remember, he um, technically no longer has cancer. 
However, we transitioned him to warfarin for the remaining 10 weeks as an outpatient, um, but cost of anoxaparin was prohibitive for him. At three months post-transplant, he starts lenalidomide maintenance therapy. Now, this lenalidomide dose is less than the um, treatment dose. Um, however, we decided to continue with warfarin now for secondary VTE prophylaxis while on Revlovid maintenance therapy, as he had had pulmonary embolus um, previously. Despite maintenance therapy, he relapses again. He undergoes an al allogeneic stem cell transplant, which is complicated by fungal sinusitis. On day 47, post allo SCT, he develops a left lower extremity DVT. He goes to his local emergency room where the physician prescribes dabigatran 150 milligrams BID, and he calls you and he asks for your advice. You recall his medication list and realize that he is on medications that could affect dabigatran plasma levels. Case number one follow-up question, uh, which of the following medications are contraindicated or are relative contraindications for the use of one of the new oral anticoagulants? Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, voriconazole, tacrolimus, ABNC, or BNC? And the answer is E, B, and C. Both voriconazole and tacrolimus affect uh, P glycoprotein transport and CYP3A4, which are um, both used in the metabolism of the new oral anticoagulants. And we recently had a case just last week of a post-transplant patient actually admitted to our uh, CCU, and one of our uh, TIMI study uh, investigators involved in the clinical trials of uh, one of the new oral anticoagulants um, if for atrial fibrillation, wanted to use one of these drugs uh, in, in uh, this post-transplant patient who was on tacrolimus, but also vorconazole and a number of other drugs and was having acute graft versus host disease of the gut. And I suggested that this was not an ideal patient in which to use one of these new oral anticoagulants due to drug-drug interactions, and it, particularly with gut GVH due to GI absorption issues and the fact that um, two of the um, new oral anticoagulants are associated with increased GI bleeding risk. So this is a brief list of drugs that affect P glycoprotein and CYP3A4. Dabigatran is metabolized or affected, plasma levels are affected only by PGP, so you don't, do not need to worry about CYP3A4 drugs that either inhibit or induce. But for in particularly rivaroxaban and to some degree um, apixaban, as well as adaxaban, there are various, um, those new oral anticoagulants are metabolized by CYP3A4. So any drug that induces or inhibits the activity of CYP3A4 and PGP will affect your plasma levels, and we have no way to monitor. The big categories are the azole antifungals, protease inhibitors, including HIV medications, um, immunosuppressive drugs, um, cyclosporin and TAC. Um, there was a debate with our, the head of our transplant program and myself about sirolimus and whether or not sirolimus has as strong effect as cyclosporin. In Europe, cyclosporin is a contraindication to using um, uh, certainly dabigatran. Clarithromycin has dose adjustment uh, guidelines with apixaban, so that if you have a patient um, that you want to prescribe apixaban and you give them a clarithromycin, you actually need to drop the dose by 50%. So the reason I point all of this out is to um, keep in mind that our cancer patient populations and our hematology pa patient populations are often on medications that were not involved in studies and that do affect um, metabolism of PGP I'm sorry, the activity of PGP or CYP3A4, and we need to keep this in mind. Uh, case number two in the next six minutes um, is a 64-year-old woman with a history of ITP who is seen for left leg swelling after a trip to St. Bart's to escape the winter in Boston. Um, this was actually a case this year. She is diagnosed with an extensive left lower extremity DVT, and you are called for treatment advice by her local emergency room at the time of the diagnosis of the DVT. Her platelet count is 78,000. They want to know whether or not she can be safely anticoagulated. In order to best manage this patient, the next information that you need is, does she have a prior history of VTE? Is there a family history of VTE? Does ITP cause VTE? Does she have normal renal and hepatic function? 
And does she have May Thurner syndrome? And so the answer is D, does she have normal renal and hepatic function? Because whether or not she has normal renal and hepatic function will help guide your choice of uh, anticoagulants. Her platelet count is certainly adequate, uh, particularly compared to our cancer population, to start full intensity anticoagulation um, with normal renal and hepatic function and no other bleeding risks. Again, patients with ITP, the urban legend, which actually is borne up in the lab, is that patients have larger, stickier um, platelets. Um, so the risk of bleeding in a patient with ITP in a platelet count of 78,000 on anticoagulation is very low. So you can actually use in this patient on no other medications your choice of low molecular weight heparin, bridge to warfarin, uh, a new oral anticoagulant, rivaroxaban or apixaban um, up front uh, without the need for low molecular weight heparin. Both are approved to treat VTE. Or if you choose dabigatran or adoxaban, you need to use a five-day lead-in of low molecular weight heparin before switching to dabigatran or adoxaban. So the question that then arises, she's been started on initial anticoagulation treatment. Do you need to do anything to manage the ITP? And so I'm just going to briefly, very briefly, touch on whether or not patients with ITP actually have an increased risk of developing VTE, because this is, um, is something that comes up frequently. Patients in one study um, published in the British Journal of Hematology um, in a uh, 300 patients, 391 chronic ITP patients were compared with 3,000 match controls in a Danish registry study and were found to have a two and a half fold increase in development of VTE uh, compared to non ITP um, uh, cohort of patients. In a, and this was not a prospective, in a um, UK um, retrospective cohort match study, they compared uh, 1,000 ITP patients with 4,000 matched controls and found a hazard ratio for VTE of 1.58 um, compared to baseline. And another study um, done by Bennett in the United States um, looked at um, a health plan administrative claims database and found a 6.9% cumulative incidence of thromboembolic events in patients with chronic uh, primary ITP over 15 month period. And the association of platelet count with thrombosis in ITP is actually quite interesting because those patients with mild um, thrombos, uh, thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of 75 to 150,000, the rate ratios um, compared to uh, normal controls are lower than for those with moderate or severe uh, thrombocytopenia. And there are a lot of hand waving um, uh, sort of uh, mechanistic uh, proposals as to why uh, these patients might be at higher risk, um, whether it has to do with increased thrombopoietin, increased upregulation of vascular endothelium, platelet microparticles, uh, or treatments itself directed at um, the severe thrombocytopenia is, is not clear. Um, briefly, the types of thrombosis in ITP. Um, again, the dashed lines are patients with primary ITP. The solid lines are patients uh, who do not have ITP, and both venous and thromboembolic, uh, both venous and arterial events are higher in, in patients with ITP compared to matched controls. So this patient had an initial response to steroids when diagnosed three and a half years ago. She has been treated with rituximab after failing th three cycles of pulse dexis dexamethasone, and that was um, three and a half years ago. And her platelets over the last uh, half year have been ranging between 60 to 80,000. This is clearly a provoked DVT in the setting of air travel. And so we deem that her duration of anticoagulation should um, be three months. So we, um, our approach is to carefully follow these patients during anticoagulation. Um, but some people would actually preemptively um, treat to increase the platelet count, even though her platelet count is 78,000. And the answer to the question of whether or not she should be treated is really there's no right or wrong answer, and it depends on the individual patient um, characteristics. So if it's a patient whose platelet count has recently and dramatically fallen from 250,000 to 78,000, you would be much more concerned that she's on a rapid downward decline than if, if as in this patient, her platelet count has been 60 to 80,000 over the last six months, and you can carefully monitor her.
Um, we have options available to rapidly increase the platelet count if it falls below 50,000 or if she develops bleeding. And I would state that if her platelet count plummets, um, anticoagulation would be held. And then you can use steroids, either dexamethasone or prednisone, and that's a 15-minute discussion um, of, over which uh, to use. Um, however, the onset of action for um, steroids um, can take as long as 5 to 10 days to see an increase in the platelet count. IVIgG um, uh, confers the most rapid response with, to treatment with an increase in the platelet count within 12 to 24 hours. And so by 48 hours, you can see a significant increase uh, in the platelet count. And thrombopoietin mimetics um, can be used either rom romiplistim, which is N-plate, or L-thrombopag, which is Promacta. However, the onset of action of these agents can take uh, one to sometimes three weeks, depending on the patient. And so I'm going to um, uh, briefly discuss the last point, which is do thrombopoietin emetics increase the risk of VTE? And these are two studies from the initial clinical um, phase three studies, romiplistim, l -trombopag. Low numbers of patients um, in both of these. Um, no difference between placebo and romiplistim with regard to incidence of thrombosis, 2.4% in this short duration study. Um, and the same is true um, for l thrombopag zero uh, TE events in placebo, and 2% TE events in patients um, on l thrombopag So I will um, actually stop there. So we've got, uh, thank you, Jean. Thanks. So we, we.